Paul and, Bar- Barnab- Paul and Silas, rather. Acts 16, 29. They are bound in stocks in a jail in Philippi. Their backs are lacerated from the caning. The blood is slowly drying into scabs. It's now midnight. And these two fellows are singing and praising God in the darkness of that prison cell. Suddenly there's an earthquake that shakes so violently that the doors of the prison are shaken open. The stocks that were holding them fast have been loosed. And the jailer, awakening out of his sleep because of the earthquake, seeing the doors to the prison open, figured that the prisoners must have escaped, and so he started to commit suicide. Because under the Roman law, if prisoners that were given to his charge would escape, he would have to serve their sentence. And so he was ready to commit suicide when Paul cried out to him, Do yourself no harm, we are all here. And so we read that he called for a light and he came into Paul and Silas trembling and falling down before them. And so we get to our text tonight, the 29th verse of Acts 16. I believe that the trembling of this hardened prison guard was the result of a heavy move of God's spirit upon his heart. It surely wasn't for fear of the prisoners escaping now because he's been assured that they are all there. But when God's spirit works in a heavy way upon a person's heart, there is often a sort of unexplained trembling that happens. When I was a boy in Ventura, our family had come home on a Sunday afternoon from a vacation. My dad and mother decided not to go to church that night, and so my sister and I went to church together. I don't remember the message. I do remember the invitation that I felt strangely moved by God to go forward and to pray. I turned to my friend, Robert Feynman, I said, let's go forward. He said, oh, no, no, not me. And so I said, well, I'm going. And I went forward, and I, as I was praying, began to tremble. I can't explain what it was, why it was. There was just a strong conviction of God's Spirit upon my heart, and I I was trembling. When my sister and I got home that night from church, my parents were still up in the living room, and I tried to explain to them the interesting experience that I had in church that night of this uncontrolled trembling, just a a, a trembling that I can't really explain. But in trying to explain it to my parents or talk to them about it, I was trembling too much to even tell them about it. Uh, a very unusual and interesting experience. And, and I do believe that there is that trembling when a person becomes conscious, very conscious of the presence of God. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God said, Will you not tremble at my presence? And all I can say is that I felt the presence of God so strong upon my life that night that I experienced this uncontrollable trembling. When Paul was witnessing to that uh, Roman governor, Felix, who was a very despicable man, as Paul was witnessing to him about righteousness, about living a right kind of life, It says that he began to tremble. He was under conviction by the Holy Spirit. 
And he said, we'll talk about this another time. And he passed it off. But he actually began that trembling or quivering as the result of the power and the dynamic of God's spirit working on his heart. As the jailer came in trembling, he asked the important question. What must I do to be saved? A moment earlier, he had fear for his own life. He thought that the prisoners had escaped. And for fear of his own life, he was going to take suicide rather than to be put to death by the magistrates. Now he has fear concerning his soul. The real fear now is his eternal destiny. And so, what must I do to be saved from the judgment of God that is going to come upon the unrighteous, upon the sinner? It's a question that really should concern all of us. What must I do to be saved? It seems like the question indicates something of the mission of the ministry in Paul and Silas. Because where would he even get the thought of salvation? He is in a Roman colony, but in a Grecian culture. And in the religions of Greece and Rome, there is no concept of salvation. In most religions, there is no concept of salvation. There is the concept of enlightenment, but not of salvation. And so where did he get the idea of salvation? What must I do to be saved? Where did the consciousness come that he was actually lost in his present state? So that he would be questioning, what must I do to be saved. No one has or thinks of salvation unless they have a sense that they are lost. Salvation is a term that is associated with Christianity, but not with pagan religions. Perhaps he had heard this young girl who had been following Paul and the company around crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who show us the way of salvation. Maybe he heard this girl. Maybe he saw her following them, or perhaps people had told him about this girl. Most people in town knew about this girl because of the fact that these uh, demonic powers that controlled her gave her a ability to uh, sort of tell fortunes and she was well known to the people in town and and the fact that she's for several days following them around crying out these men are servants of the most high god who show us the way of salvation uh, that could have been sort of the, the talk of philippi people were curious about these jews that had come with this interesting message of a messiah who had died and had risen again. And so there was the great buzz through town about these Jews that were there. Whatever, somehow, some way, he had a consciousness of the fact that he was lost and was needing salvation. He had seen now a dramatic work of God. He had seen the prison opened by the earthquake. He saw that the prisoners did not escape, though they had every opportunity to do so. Moved and touched by the divine phenomena, he is aware and conscious of his own sin of the evil that is in his heart. 
And thus he falls on his knees and said, what must I do to be saved? Perhaps he'd even heard Paul and Silas preaching about salvation and sort of laughed it off as those crazy Jews talking about salvation. You see, according to Greek philosophy, salvation was impossible. They said, once a man is down, there is no redeeming of that man. That was their conclusion. But here are men who are talking to them about the possibility of salvation, the possibility of living a changed life. A life on a higher level. A life that is no longer dominated by the powers of a person's own lust and desires. But a life that is devoted to higher ideals of reaching out and loving others and ministering to others and helping others and forgiving others. And suddenly he realizes, I need help. What must I do to be saved? In answer to his question, Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Paul didn't say, well, fellow, tell you what. God has predestined those that are going to be saved. And unless you're one of those that have been predestined, uh, tough. You just won't make it. No, no. You see, the Bible says, whosoever will. Let him come. Drink of the water of life freely. Paul didn't give him any complicated process to go through. He didn't say, well, now you have to join the church. You have to pledge to support the church. You have to observe certain sacraments. But he answered very simply, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Jesus had said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth in me has eternal life. John tells us at the end of his gospel that Jesus had done many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which John did not record in the book. But he said, these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing might have life in his name. God has made salvation so simple that no man can offer an excuse that he could not Follow the heavy regimen, or that he just could not understand, because you see, it's so simple that even a child can understand. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and your house. Paul, when he wrote to the Romans, said, For if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and just believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, certainly, it must mean more than just an intellectual kind of a believing. Well, yes, I believe that Jesus lived and that he died. James Oh, practical James said, you say you believe in God? Big deal. The devils believe in God. 
and they fear and tremble. In other words, that doesn't bring salvation. Just believing that Jesus was a great teacher or even believing that he was the Son of God and that he did die for man's sins and that he rose again, just believing those as cold facts do not save a person. It is more than just saying, well, I believe these things. It is putting your trust in them. Trusting him to redeem you from your sins. But now the word redeem has an interesting connotation. The word redeemed gives you the idea or thought of having purchased something. By paying the price, you purchased it. And if you paid the price to purchase it, then it now belongs to you. And this idea of redemption carried over to Jesus Christ. He purchased you. He paid the price to purchase you or to redeem you from the bondage and the slavery to Satan. And if then he purchased me, it means that he owns me. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, said, Don't you realize that your body really belongs to God? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. So salvation, the kind of belief. You know, it's more than just saying, well, I believe that. You can say that you believe something. But as James said, you show me your works and I'll show you your faith. Now, if I would stand here tonight in the pulpit and say, you know, folks, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, some of the terrorists from the Arab community were here tonight in the church and before we got here, and they planted a very powerful explosive right here in this pulpit that's going to be going off now in just about 60 seconds. Now, don't get, you know, concerned about it. It's just, you know, we'll probably, most of you will probably get me, but, you know, most of you will uh, be okay, you know. And if I just kept talking and standing here, you say, you really don't believe that. Of course not, because if I really believed that, I'd be out the back door and saying, scram, get out of here, you know. <laughs> so the kind of faith produces action. The faith that saves is a faith that works. Now, the works don't save me, and this is where we get confused. Because by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, a gift of God, lest any man should, not of works, lest we should boast. But yet, the works follow the faith, the genuine faith. Genuine faith will be manifested in my actions, in my changed life, in my changed attitudes. It'll be manifested in my love, in my generosity, in my kindness. My life itself will bear witness to what I genuinely and truly believe. And so, believing, that's the key that gets you into the door. But then, that True belief will then produce changes in you. And if there are no changes in you, if you continue to live uh, after the flesh, if you continue to live in your sinful practices, if you continue to go on in your same old way, you know, then chances are your belief is invalidated as actually being genuine 
because it didn't produce any real change in your life. By doing my own thing, I am actually denying the lordship of Jesus in my life. Works will never save me. I am saved by my faith in Jesus Christ, but because the faith is genuine, it will manifest itself in the works that I do. So, Paul then spoke not only to the jailer, but to the whole family, all that were in the house. And we begin to see immediately signs that there was a genuine conversion of the, Philippi, uh, the, the uh, Philippian jailer. First of all, we read that he washed their wounds. Now, this was a hardened jailer. When these guys were first turned over to him, their backs had been lacerated by the beatings. And he just takes them in to the inner prison, locks them in the stocks, doesn't bother with any kind of hygienic cleansing of the wounds or whatever, just cold and, you know, uh, but now... There's a change of heart. Now he begins to wash their wounds. Evidence that there's been a change of heart. Rather than just a cold aloofness towards these prisoners, he has now a compassion. And that's a sign of a changed heart. Jesus said, by this sign, men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And so now we see love being manifested toward Paul and Silas, a sign. The man has become a disciple. The second evidence is that he was then baptized with his house. Now, baptism is an outward kind of demonstration of what's gone on inside of my heart, inside of my life. If any man is in Christ, he's a new person. The old life that he lived is passed away. Everything becomes new. Once my life was governed and controlled by my fleshly desires, that was the whole control over my life, my desires for fleshly things, material things. Having come to Jesus Christ, there's a real change. Now my desires are for the things of the Spirit. I'm longing to be like God, who the Bible describes as filled with love and compassion, gracious and merciful. And I want to be like him. And, and I'm not as selfish. I'm not as self-centered. I'm not just thinking of myself anymore. I'm thinking more now of others. Even as the Philippian jailer now starts to think of how he can bring comfort and, and all to Paul and Silas. So baptism represents the death of that old life that was mastered by my own lust. Dead. So what do you do with something that's dead? You bury it. So the water represented the grave, and that old life was buried. But then, as you come up out of the water, the idea is, I'm a new person. I have a new life. No longer a life that is governed by the flesh, but now a life that's governed by the Spirit of God. And thus, he was baptized. The sign of, the outward sign of the inward work that had gone on by the Spirit. And then we read that he set meat before them. You know, it's interesting how that once your life has been changed... Your desire is to now share what you have with others. Hospitality. Uh, that's one of the gifts of the Spirit. 
just being hospitable, an open door. And here we find him now serving a dinner to his guest. The fourth sign is that we see that he was rejoicing. You know, I don't believe that you can have a genuine conversion without experiencing the emotion of joy and rejoicing. And now the fellow is just rejoicing. Not long ago he was going to take his own life. But now he's rejoicing because he has found his life. True life. Real life. Rejoicing doesn't save you, but it is sure a sign that you are saved. Now, in the morning, the magistrates sent the sergeant down to release Paul and Silas. So they came to the house of the uh, prison guard and he said, release the two fellows that, you know, you put in the stocks last night. And so he was excited. He said, oh, they've, they've sent down to release you. Oh, this is great, you know. They've released you. Paul said, wait a minute. Not so fast. I'm a Roman citizen. What they did was totally illegal. It was illegal. In fact, it was a capital offense to beat a Roman citizen upon which there had been no charges filed. The magistrates could be put to death for what they did. They uh, probably looked more closely at the case. They realized that the case that was brought against Paul and Silas was really no case at all. These men, these commercial men, who had control over this gal who could tell fortunes, they were making a lot of money off of her until the demon spirit was cast out. And then she couldn't do that anymore and they had lost their little golden goose, so to speak. And so they are upset. And they come bringing Paul and Silas, dragging them in and making these charges and all. And probably they responded in haste, beat them, you know, and throw them in jail. But then when they started to really examine the evidence, they realized that these were just trumped up charges by these men who created the riot over the fact that they had lost the profit that they were making off of this girl. So that is probably the reason why they ordered Paul and Silas to be released. They had now had a chance to really look the thing over and realize there was no case there. But Paul is going to make an issue out of it at this point. They beat us openly without charge. As Roman citizens, you tell them, come down yourself and release us. Don't send us a sergeant down to release us. Come on down yourself. <laughs> and so the sergeant went back and said, they, they said, you guys better come down because they're Roman citizens and you guys have violated the Roman law. And they were fearful. They came down and they begged Paul, you know, you know sorry about this, Paul, you know. And <laughs> it's interesting. The commercial interests were upset by the gospel. In Ephesus, it was Demetrius, the silversmith, who created a riot because he got the fellows of his same craft together and they said, you know, this Paul is telling the people that Diana is not really a god. And people, look how our business has dropped off. All, all these little silver idols that we've been selling of Diana. People aren't buying them anymore because... Paul's telling them she's not a god. 
we got to do something about this, or man, we're going to go bankrupt. And so they created this whole big uh, movement of the people, a whole riot, gathering the people into the uh, great theater there in Ephesus, stirring it up, the commercial interest. It's interesting that it, and unfortunate, that many times people do hold their commercial interest even above the work of God or a right relationship with God. We think about how Jesus, when he came to the other side of the Sea of Galilee over in the area of the Gadarenes, and there were those two men living in the tombs with unclean spirits, men who lived miserable, tormented lives, screaming, crying out, taking rocks, cutting themselves. And when Jesus came, they rushed down in a threatening manner. But Jesus cast the demons out of these men. The demons went into a herd of swine that were on the hillside which ran violently down the steep embankment there into the sea and were drowned. And you remember the people of the city came out to Jesus and they said, would you please leave? Now they saw the man, it said, that was once, you know, insane. They saw him sitting there. He's now clothed. He's in his right mind. But rather than rejoicing over the fact that this fellow who was once a mad raving maniac is is now there in his right mind and, and all, they're more interested in the loss of their pig business. It is interesting, and next Monday night when we hopefully will conclude Revelation... We'll be getting into the 18th chapter where the judgment of God comes upon this commercial system of the world that has brought the world into slavery in a great sense. Slaves to our own lust. How many people today really are slaves to their possessions. Their paycheck, they rarely see it. They, you know, they've got to make the payment on the TV. They've got to make the... And, and they make you think that you can't live without these things. That you have to have a BMW to be able to drive to the store. Ford won't do it. And and so we get over our heads in debt. And it's all designed that way. And it's evil. There is a proper profit. Person has to stay in business. But the business of gouging. Look at the Enron. And the stuff that's coming out of that. That's evil. God's going to judge it. Here in Philippi, and of course, this is just, it's not something new. It isn't Enron. It's, you know, you can go back through history and you can see the evil influence that money has over people. And as the scripture said, the love of money is the root of all evil. It'll come under judgment. We'll get that next Monday night as we look at 18. But... Paul, Silas, they go back to the house of Lydia, the first convert, and the place where they've been staying. They sort of said their farewells. Uh, It would seem that they left Timothy and Luke there in Philippi to really sort of confirm the converts. While Paul and Silas moved on then over to Thessalonica. So we'll find them in Thessalonica in our next lesson. 
Father, we do thank you for the help, the instruction that we can get from your word. How grateful we are, Lord, for the salvation and the simplicity of salvation. And Lord, give us that kind of faith that works. Not just saying that I believe but believing to the extent that it is manifested by my changed life, by the priorities of my life today. A changed heart, Lord. A heart that is now after you rather than after the material things of this world. And so, Lord, we come to you tonight again thanking you for your work in us asking you to continue that work until as with David we will be satisfied when we awake in your likeness make us like you Lord we ask in Jesus name Amen